I kind of joked with Scott Sheffield because <laughs> he has tried to retire before um, and he came back. But this time it feels for real. In April, he said he was stepping down by the end of this year. So I have to wonder, like, how much of this is wrapped into it. Right. Um, but from Darren Wood's side, it truly is having this massive technological powerhouse that you're able to bring now to a massive amount of shale rock in the U.S. I mean, he was talking about four-mile laterals. Basically, that's a really, really, really long pipe horizontally in the ground. The max that people are doing right now in shale in the U.S. is three miles. And this is like an Exxon thing that they can bring to this rock that they desperately need. So we saw, Fernando, that this is going to be, this is going to make Exxon the largest player in the Permian, this deal. What else stood out to you in terms of highlights as far as what's advantageous about the deal for both companies? Maybe some other, uh, you know, numbers that really caught your eye. Yeah, absolutely. I think to Alex's point, it's part of the technology. You know, we're a little dubious that they'll get to $2 billion, but maybe they will if that really pans out. But also it's the integration uh, downstream uh, with with this new rock that Alex is talking about. Remember that uh, Exxon has a significant presence in the Houston area with their refineries, uh, carbon capture as well that they're establishing now. So that's how Darren can get to that more responsible oil company, more responsible oil that he mentioned in Alex's interview. Um, and the other point is, you guys talked about cost of capital not impacting. I think quite the contrary. It makes Exxon the preferred destination. Again, from Alex's interview, Scott Sheffield said it was the most attractive equity out of all the majors to, in his view. And because they have that double A rating and they are such a large player that can develop this rock at a very cost competitive basis. Well, just to follow up on that quickly, Fernando, because I noticed this is an all stock deal. So maybe then you're not like dealing as much if you were to have a cash funded portion that you'd have to tap debt markets. And so is that maybe playing in a little bit there with in terms of like the cost of financing? Exactly. So it, all equity deal. And then importantly, Pioneer now is uh, expected to gen generate about four and a half billion dollars in free cash flow in 2024. And the dividend burden from the shares issued by Exxon to buy it, it's only about two point one billion dollars. So they actually get some extra free cash flow out of that that they can use to either do more buybacks or continue to grow at a faster pace. Hey, Alex, I want to bring you back into this conversation. Exxon has been on the lookout for acquisitions in the Permian Basin for years, but really struggled with the timing. Why is that? Huh. Yeah, I think I think you're referring to a 2010 acquisition <laughs> yes. of XTO Energy, which basically called the peak in gas prices at, right after they bought it. This was really their first jump into shale and was a gas play at that point. Gas prices totally cratered. And they admit it. They're like, this was a terrible, terrible price and a terrible, terrible acquisition. Um, this one feels a little different in that they're already in the basin. Like, this is not a new thing for them. And this is really about leveraging their existing technology to get more oil out of something that's already proven and that's already there. Now, you might argue, well, if you're going to get more oil out more efficiently, does that actually lead to more production, which in essence means a lower price? True. But a lot of this oil and this acreage that Pioneer is bringing to this deal, you can still get 10% return on like sub 50 oil. So it's okay as long as you don't like crater oil at the same time. And it looks like the price band for oil in that marginal barrel has kind of moved up from like 60 to maybe 80. So it gives them a lot of wiggle room at that point. So Fernando, you were just saying that you're skeptical of this $2 billion. I assume you meant that was the estimated cost savings, right? That that's what the Exxon CEO says is going to be possible from this deal. And that's something, you know, CEOs love to talk about that during right. M&A. I'm sure Jess knows this better than anyone. They love to talk about expected cost savings, those synergies. That's a big synergies. word. Love a good synergy. <laughs> so, Fernando, tell us, why are you skeptical? All right. So about half of those synergies are actually that improved technology, the recovery factor improving. And that's been a difficult battle for most oil companies, including Pioneer. Um, the efficiency ratings on most shale wells has kind of plateaued over the past couple of years. So Exxon would have to bring something truly new, and maybe those four mile laterals will do it. But it's 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 a it's a prove to me story um, as opposed to uh, take it take it at its word because at, to date the cube technology that Exxon has touted hasn't really panned out for most of its peers. So. We wait to see if they can actually get that improved recovery that's about half of those synergies. Hey, Alex, what issues, if any, could arise that could make this transaction potentially fall apart? 
Oh, man. I mean, lots of them. I just don't know if it's actually going to happen. I mean, you could have another major come in and kind of swoop in to buy it, but I find that to be highly doubtful. So uh, Conoco, I don't think, would make this kind of big acquisition. Uh, Chevron's still absorbing some of its uh, shell acquisitions. Oxy is really still uh, integrating uh, Anadarko at this point. So it doesn't feel like anyone's going to step in. The other part is regulatory. Now, technically, I guess you could make a say that, like, hey, this is a lot of Permian Basin. with 15% of production in the Permian now? But there are just so many small players in there that it's hard to make that antitrust case. In addition to the fact, why would you block an oil merger that could unleash more oil when the U.S. is talking about needing more oil? I just, like, I, I get it from, like, a green perspective, maybe, but it's going to be really difficult to make that case rather than looking at the Saudis or Iran or Venezuela for more oil. Yeah, last one here, Fernando, just in our last 30 seconds here. Tell us a little bit about, you know, we've got a lot of oil price moves lately uh, between, you know, the interest rate environment and the conflict in Israel. Can you tie that into this deal a little bit right here and how that matters? I think in the short term, we have we're a little worried about demand because the high prices are impacting how much fuel uh, we are consuming globally. But then in the longer term, as Darren alluded in the interview, there's been an underinvestment in the industry and we see a higher price, uh, which I think it's why uh, Exxon stepped into Pioneer now. It's a good timing for them uh, to buy undeveloped acreage that they can then sell at a much higher price later.